Thank you for joining us for our alumni webinar series. I'm Tracy Willits, a senior lecturer in media production in the School of Arts, and I've been asked to host this webinar as part of our YSJU alumni series, Alumni Journeys, Creativity, Careers and Community. Before I introduce today's speaker, there are a few housekeeping matters that I need to mention. So we will be hosting a Q&A at the end of the talk and the questions have been prepared in advance. But if you have any questions after watching um, this webinar and you'd like to ask the speaker, please email alumni at yorksj.ac.uk and the team will pass on your questions. There's also an auto transcript appearing during the talk for increased accessibility but please be aware it may not translate perfectly. Thank you. So I'm now going to introduce you to Emma Mallett. So with over 20 years experience in film and high-end television, Emma has worked across a broad spectrum of productions, working her way up from runner on Thomas the Tank Engine to recently stepping up to line producer on additional photography in For Damage, a new TV drama for Netflix. A production coordinator for many years, Emma has worked on a variety of budget levels from Alan Partridge, Alpha Papa, The Invisible Woman and Me Before You, to Studio Pictures, Quantum of Solace, Maleficent and Wonka. Emma is also an advocate for industry training and regularly leads workshops for new and developing production crew. Graduating in 1999 with a degree in film and television, we are excited to welcome Emma back to York St. John. And I would now like to pass you over to Emma and I look forward to chatting afterwards. Hi there. Um, so yes, I was uh, a student at York St. John uh, from 1996 to 1999. Um, I developed an interest in film and television when I was in my sort of mid-teens, uh, having watched quite a lot of, um, you know, movies <laughs> during that time. I decided that actually something that I quite like to do is kind of be within the credits and the kind of end roller of a film. That was kind of, I guess, my kind of key ambition and was just kind of trying to work out how that was, you know, something that I could do. I was particularly interested in camera camera work, cinematography, and I felt that that was probably where my passions would lie going into film and television. Um, so I sort of aimed my A-levels uh, towards uh, theatre studies and sort of art and uh, arty things, drama. I was doing acting, I was doing all kinds of things. And then I uh, got my foot in the door at York St. John's uh, to do uh, a degree in film, television, literature and theatre studies, uh, which it was what it was called at that time. And I was um, based on the York uh, campus. I think I was at F Block, which I'm not sure exists anymore, um, and spent sort of three great years um, at St. John's um, working on a variety of different projects. So theatre projects, we, um, I think my favourite one was actually a a documentary that we did about some Buddhist monks, which um, I think we're in a little town, Bubworth nearby. And um, there were three of us working on the project and we kind of, you know, went into the lives of these um, uh, amazing monks who had sort of sacrificed, you know, all the things that you know, we were doing at university at that time, um, you know, for their kind of spiritual life, um, coming off from, you know, different backgrounds. It was quite kind of eye opening. And um, and I think that was probably one of my favourite projects there. I also did, I think, a photography module and, you know, we did plenty of plays um, and all those kinds of things and really it was kind of a discovery time to work out exactly kind of where my passions were lying and I still felt that sort of cinematography was uh, the way that I wanted to go. Um, I think one of the things I discovered on the course was maybe that I wasn't a really a writer, I wasn't really um, sort of a very a uh, creative person where I felt like I could write. I think when we then had um, kind of modules where, you know, the whole year group were writing scripts, mine were quite poor in comparison and were never picked. So I think it was sort of a realization that although maybe I felt I was creative, that maybe um, I wasn't massively successful in it and that maybe my um you know my skills were were kind of better placed elsewhere so um I think when I graduated in 99 I was still kind of full of verb to kind of go into the camera department I'd done a um a internship in the summer of my second year I think it was uh, where I worked in a production company just for a month and um 
one of the things they'd organized for me on the internship was actually to meet uh, one of the key men at Panavision, which was very exciting for me. I got to go into the camera house, look at all the lenses and the cameras. And I actually got my kind of first day on set where I visited um, a set with him. So I was still kind of full blown, you know, into camera. I then decided that I was going to take um, a gap year. I worked and temped in a uh, a company for a year just getting kind of basic skills in sort of um, computers which I know sounds a bit mad but obviously 20 years ago we didn't have social media computers were kind of still a bit new not everybody particularly had their own <laughs> laptop or computer which I know seems really strange um, but uh, so I sorry lost my train of thought there <laughs> but, um, so I uh, yes, I, I, I learned some temping skills. I, you know, learned how to use computers a bit more, how to, I was thinking like just doing data entry and stuff like this, but I made some money to go traveling and I went to Australia for a year and I took my little camcorder with me and I spent kind of a year recording my year away and, you know, thinking, oh, maybe I'll make something out of this one day. And to say I never have, I've never actually looked at the footage and I probably should one day. Uh, I'm sure it'd be quite funny. Um, but I came back from that thinking I still wanted to be in camera and basically I had an interview with um, sort of a, a camera company who basically told me that I was a girl and I didn't look particularly fit and that probably I wouldn't make it in camera, which nowadays is something which obviously is completely utter lie. And back then I kind of took it on its face value and thought, oh dish. And I, I went to the interview dressed in a in a suit dress and a and a like a suit jacket, which um just shows you how unprepared I was actually for going into the industry because you, the industry means that you can wear whatever you want. You can have 1200 piercings, you can have 600 tattoos, you know, you can be who you want to be in this industry. It's not something where you have to wear a suit or, you know, it's not what we call the nine to five. I kind of call it the five to nine, uh, just sometimes because of the hours. Um, but um, so yeah, it's, I obviously was completely, you know, I, I must have just looked like an alien going in in this kind of, you know, this suit to a, to a camera agency looking back on it. But I kind of took it on its face value, which maybe I shouldn't have done back then. But I kind of thought, OK, well, I'm still going to carry on trying. And I sent CVs out. Um, I must say I probably hadn't had as much kind of guidance as to getting in the industry, uh, kind of coming out of university my sister gave me some advice on kind of my cv to keep it to one page and actually kind of uh doing a industry cv is something that i actually kind of regularly teach now with some of the training that i that i do in the industry um but basically yes keeping it to one page clear of waffle um direct to the point and sort of putting you know realistically what level you're going in at um i.e if you want to be a producer or a director do not write that on your cv when you're starting in the industry you are a runner and you put that you're a runner on your cv so i sent out about 25 cvs thinking oh they'll all come for me you know i've got a degree and i've done this and you know and basically no one rang me and you know it was a bit of a hard lesson and so obviously i had to keep sending out more and more cvs and back then there was a weird thing called the post where we posted things. We didn't really email things. Um, so I kept posting, you know, CVs out, printing them off and posting them. And then eventually, I think it was, well, six months in, I had my, I had a call for an interview, which was Shepparton Studios and it was on Thomas the Tank Engine. And this was my first job. And I was PA to the head of special effects and model making. And it was an exciting time. They were, fil they were filming like Harry Potter. You know, I could see Harry Potter filming kind of out of one end of the little hut that I was working in. And they were filming, I think it was Finding Neverland with like Johnny Depp um, opposite. So it was quite exciting to see kind of all these, you know, big actors walking around. And, you know, I was kind of, on this cute little set, um, I think it was I stage, which was, um, you know, it wasn't a sound stage because uh, there wasn't any sound on Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, and basically like, you know, a train would, you know, uh, the shot list of the day was kind of for a train to drive from one end of the track to the other with a bit of smoke coming out the top was kind of like a big scene, <laughs> you know, so it was quite, quite different because obviously this was physically, this wasn't like a 3D, this was physically, um, you know, obviously making it with um, with models and special effects. So um, my job on that was probably for about six months. And then I um, had to try and find a new job uh, when that one finished. And I obviously sent out my CVs um, everywhere again. 
and um, I had a call for a company called Tiger Aspect Productions. And I'd heard of Tiger Aspect, Tiger, I mean, it's still obviously uh, a great company today. It does lots of really incredible comedy and dramas and a bit of everything. It does, you know, entertainment. It kind of was a real kind of gamut of everything. And they were based in Soho Square. And I was, um, I basically joined the animation department there on a show called Mr. Bean, which you might have heard of. Uh, so this, um, now actually my daughter, who's seven, sometimes watches Mr. Bean, which is quite funny. Um, and I had a bit of a... I've had a couple of sliding doors moments in my career where it's kind of like obviously you can kind of go one way or the other and one of those came up actually after two weeks of me starting at Tiger that I had a call to uh, to do a film down I think it was down in Cornwall and um, they wanted me to be uh, an AD a floor runner on a film that was down uh, down in the West Country and at this point I was kind of like right well wow this is a film and that's kind of what I want to do but it's ADing which is different from what I know because I'm kind of you know used to being now kind of on the computer doing more kind of admin sort of site type stuff more production type stuff um, but I had made a commitment and I'd committed to the show that I was on and I actually really enjoyed what I was doing and I was kind of running around Soho having a great time meeting all these new people um it was a very exciting company to be in and so I said no I'm sorry I'm I'm not available I've you know I've just started another job and that was kind of one of those moments where I could probably now be like a, an AD assuming that I'd have done that job and you know like being an assistant director and have gone that way but I decided that I made a commitment, I enjoyed where I was, and I carried on basically in production. And then from there, my career kind of, I moved around within Tiger, was kind of how I moved from my job to job. I kind of, I did again, like I think six months on Mr. Bean, and then that job finished. And then I uh, became a production secretary, so I stepped up to the next level. Um on uh, a kid series called Star, I think with Nicholas Holt when he was, you know, still a young boy. And um, and I had kind of, when I'd been a runner, I was kind of, with our, when I was in the animation department, I was also sort of a general runner at Tiger. And I just really tried to make myself indispensable. And I think that's one of the key things when you're starting out is to really try and make yourself shine um you know you should bring your a game every day because you are a freelancer if you're in actual kind of core production um within film and tv you are a freelancer you're moving around jobs every you could be on dailies your job could be a day your job could be a week it could be 18 months it it really does vary from show to show job to job and I think that's what keeps it interesting for me is that you know there's new challenges you're meeting new people every time every job is kind of different you can be in children's you can be in film you can be on an alien show you can be on a costume drama it's it sort of it changes up kind of every time you change your job and everybody else is in the same boat everyone else is trying to find work as well so everyone kind of understands there's no kind of sending your cv to somebody and sort of putting yourself out there is not something that you need to be afraid of because literally the person you're sending it to is doing the very same thing themselves um so that's what we we rely on you putting yourself out there to us so don't be afraid to kind of come forward you know and say hi i'm i'm new and come get me you know um so um so I kind of worked around different shows um kind of in the in the comedy department I then I think moved to open mic where I was doing a bit more kind of um they do a lot more kind of stand-up stuff I was working on a, on a comedy drama with uh, Jack D over there I did a couple of kind of live show events as well which were quite fun um and then I actually got in into drama series um through somebody that I'd work with who knew somebody and that's how a lot of this industry works it's obviously a bit of who you know I think getting in the door anyone you know who can get you that first foot in the door is obviously a great thing um I mean obviously there's a lot of talk about nepotism in our industry which I think is happening kind of less and less I have to say um but also on the flip side of it there are it's kind of a family business for some people you have teams of kind of assistant directors you have electrical departments that are all kind of families so it kind of is also to be respected in a way as well because it's it's like if you were construction to you know construction companies have you know families that run them and it's kind of sometimes the family business so it kind of can be seen a little bit kind of either way but there has obviously been a massive boom in the industry within the last, certainly the last five years, um, you know, obviously the introduction of, you know, streaming services, 
we call them SVODs, uh, which is streaming video on demand. Um, and the rise of those in high-end TV has, you know, created a massive kind of vacuum in skilled crew. So now is really the time to be getting in the industry. And we're working on incentives to try and get you all on board because we need you to sustain our industry because obviously there is, you know, so much work coming in. And certainly the last couple of years, there haven't been enough stages and facilities and places to shoot, cast, you know, um, crews have been very thin on the ground. So there have been, you know, huge incentives to try and tell people you can be in this industry, you can get in, it's not just who you know, and it's us trying to find ways to get that message out and where you should try and kind of come in, which I'll get, you know, I can get into a bit more a bit later. Um, but yeah, so I've moved into drama series. So I was working on things like um, a now defunct show called Family Affairs um, and another one called The Bill, which I think is now obviously slightly defunct. Um, but we're running long running sort of, you know, kind of soap type series for a long time. And that actually on one of those was how I got my in into features. So I was um, the, the show I was on Family Affairs was decommissioned and another coordinator kind of came in to cover me while I went off to do another show in the building called The Bill because uh, they were both kind of run out of the same place in Wimbledon and um, and she was a film coordinator and she was between jobs and basically I showed her how kind of TV worked and she knew kind of more how film worked and she was obviously impressed with how I kind of handle things or you know and she said well would you be interested in being a film and I was like well yes of course I would so six months later I then got a call from her to do um, first film, which was my film I, I did called 1408, um, uh, which is, a, I think, John Cusack and Samuel L. Jackson horror film. And that was kind of my first introduction. And it was quite different. It was really long hours. Um, and hours is something that has changed a lot in the last few years. Um, certainly within my industry, there's been a lot more regulation about how we work what hours we can work what overtime we get paid um but you know 20 you know 15 20 years ago you know we we, we did work in you know incredibly long hours sometimes and so that was quite the difference um really between the two and i think sometimes the the detail that goes into stuff on film it's a lot slower there's a lot less shot a day um sometimes you have a lot more prep time so everything was a bit more kind of intensified on one thing there was more time to work on lists you know unit lists or crewing people or um you know they would seen more time, although there never ever seems enough time for anything um and so I did that film and I was kind of a bit unsure after my first film whether I wanted to carry on because I think I was just pretty exhausted afterwards and I was like oh I don't know if I if this is really what I want to do and I kind of went back into tv just to do little bits and bobs and then I got an email with four letters which spot bond and um I was like oh okay then <laughs> maybe I will stay in film and I I basically ended up working uh, on my my favorite film of my career I've say so far um because it was very special um on Quantum of Solace um so I came on board as the assistant to uh, a lovely gentleman called Anthony Way who was a first AD on Star Wars um and he was one of the executive producers and I was his assistant and I basically worked on that for 18 months. So I did six months prep, six months shoot. I went to Mexico and worked on the aerial unit. And then I spent about two months traveling around Italy um, with the second unit there, sort of with the stunt unit. Um, and then six months post. So it was kind of dealing with the credits and a build up to uh, the premiere and all this kind of stuff, which was a really special, special job for me. Um, that I you know, feel very fondly back on my time on that. Um, and then basically I, you know, obviously decided to carry on in film and then it was kind of um, a funny kind of jiggle of uh, working my way kind of back up where I had got to the level of being what's called a production coordinator. I kind of stepped into being like an assistant to somebody and to the exec producer. I then had to kind of step down in film to be an assistant coordinator because I had to learn how things are done in film because it's done differently. Um, so I then had to set down for a couple of jobs. I then, I think, became a second unit coordinator on one of the Johnny English films. Um, I then, to become a coordinator, stepped into some lower budget things to get my kind of credit back up to coordinator. Um, 
and I did lots of kind of independent film stuff like uh, Dom Hemingway with Jude Law and uh, The Invisible Woman, which was directed by and starring Ray Fiennes. Um, so I did quite a lot of kind of uh, independent film for quite a long time. And then I was just kind of working my kind of way up. Um, and back then there weren't as many studio films as there are now. So um, there weren't obviously all the Marvel jobs weren't, you know, weren't kind of hadn't really kind of started then but there were a few really big jobs a year and obviously everyone was kind of fighting to get on those big jobs so it was something that I was trying kept trying punching 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 to kind of make my way up to be one of the people on the list to be on those big jobs um and then basically probably about seven or eight years ago I got the big job and I got offered one of the Star Wars films to coordinate which for me was like right I've arrived I finally got there but then I had another sliding doors moment because it was kind of like, well, that's going to be 18 months of my life. And I was now at this time in my mid thirties. And I was like, well, I kind of have to make a decision here if I want to do the big job or if I want to have a baby. And I made the decision to have the baby um, because to be honest, I'd, I'd, I knew that I'd kind of got there and I got as far as I could within that level. And that basically when I then came back from sort of having my child, I could then start kind of happily production managing, which was kind of like the next step up the ladder for me. And the thing that I really like about production is the ladder. You kind of start out as a runner, you kind of move up to production secretary, then you become what's called like an assistant coordinator, a coordinator, there's now a role called like a supervisor, you're then a production manager, and then kind of at the top, you're kind of a line producer, which is actually where I've just sort of recently moved up to now. So, and with that, you have a different gamut of responsibilities with each of those levels. And sometimes over the last few years, they've kind of changed a bit what exactly those responsibilities are. Um, but with that also comes kind of like a money increase as well. So there's always like an incentive that the money kind of really at the next level is going to, you know, is going to increase as you go up, which is obviously very helpful. And part of the reason we're all working because uh, we uh, we work to live, not live to work. Um, so um, and then after kind of career after having a child is also interesting, um, obviously because of long hours and all that kind of stuff. But I made it work for me. I ended up kind of uh, doing some like work from home. I set up my own little business kind of doing contracts, um, something called clearances, which we do in the industry for like copyright clearances about sort of things that can be shown on screen in terms of brands. Um how to like fly an emotional support dog from New York to London, which is a thing, believe it or not, or it certainly used to be. Um, weird and crazy things that we do in this industry that no one probably knows happens. Um, and I also work for a time at um, a wonderful company called Screen Skills, which if you haven't looked into and you're looking to get in the industry is something you should definitely look up, um, where they obviously do a lot of training. It's called Screen Skills and uh, they have uh, a program there called Trainee Finder, um, which takes on a cohort of it varies in numbers. I think it was 100 and, it's like 110 or 150 a year. Uh, and they have an intake of people, I think, at the end of every year in November. And they basically, uh, the, the industry puts money into kind of supporting them. And, um, you know, they have trainees that go on to each show, which are financially supported by both the production and from the donations from uh, the industry. So um, basically, you're being paid kind of on the job to be a trainee. And, um, you know, the responsibility level isn't that really of you know, a new entrant as a, as a runner, it's a time for you to kind of discover where you want to be. Um, you know, you can go and have a look generally around other departments. You might know where you're going. So they obviously have traineeships in costume and makeup and camera and production and there's account schemes and I think there's visual effects. It's kind of reaching all areas. Um, but because there is this kind of um, gap of people coming in the industry um there is definitely now a lot more thought about training about how we're getting people in there are many different training programs now i mean the bfi do them i think bafta um so if you are looking to get any in industry you can also look in your local area because they are kind of within obviously the regions they are um 
you know, throughout the country, there are different incentives. And certainly filming has changed um, over the last 10 years to go into the regions, whereas it was very kind of London centric. Now things have pushed out and, you know, Scotland is hugely busy. Wales is hugely busy. The Midlands um, is massive. You know, it's there's um, really kind of reaching out to all areas. So it really has sort of changed um the last 10 years and as I say like one of the changes recently in the last few years for me has kind of been moving into high-end tv kind of back into tv which is you know sometimes you know the budgets for these are like 12 million you know an episode or an hour um so some very huge budgets and also you know some much smaller budgets um and again it's kind of um you know, again, like the same, same, but different and very much people are moving, jumping between features and high end TV now, whereas you used to be one or the other. So, again, it's just changing. Our industry is is sort of changing and growing all the time and adapting to, you know, the new demands for high end TV and, you know, the new demands that are coming up from the crew in terms of, you know, how, what hours we work and, looking after our mental health and you know um having things like pensions and and all these kinds of things that as a freelancer you know maybe over the years we haven't um had as much kind of thought or access to there's definitely a lot of movement kind of towards that now um but yes then recently for me I've kind of recently stepped up to line producing um and I'm possibly going to do kind of a training scheme as well to help me with that and support me with that because it's kind of a new responsibility it's very much dealing with um you know the budget and overseeing a lot of money um which is quite a you know big pressure um so uh, yes I mean I would say that um there is a career if you want a career within the film and tv industry it very much is accessible now more so than it has ever been um it's persistence really um to get you know to get your foot in the door and i think generally once you're in the door you know once you've got a couple of credits really you should really you know be flying so you know it's you know within your reach so to say but um yes i think that's probably where, where we're at. Thank you very much, Emma. That was fascinating, really interesting, real insight into how you got there. I mean, to have worked on a Bond film, Quantum of Solace, and to be offered a job on Star Wars, you know, um, incredible, and, and everything else in between as well. When I made a few notes there, I thought, um, make yourself indispensable. I thought that was really, really good advice because you want to be the one that gets us back. And if, and if you work really hard and, and you know, and you're always positive and they'll, they'll want you. And, and I think that's fantastic advice. Um, and also about the, um, you know, feeling that you as a female couldn't be a, um, a cinematographer and, and go in the camera department. Do you think that's changed? Yeah, it yeah. has definitely. And I've recently worked with like full female teams as well. I think it's maybe only happened a couple of times, but I think I was just, yeah, I, I mean, it shouldn't have been said what was said anyway um but I think you know I probably could have been persistent as it was I I don't know would I have stayed in camera I kind of um I do have a brain for the spinning plates and the crazy of production um the pressure there's something about it I really love um so I think maybe it was just that kind of again like a bit of those sliding doors that it's like or oh, is this kind of moment do I pursue this or do I not and actually you know, I'm very happy, obviously, with kind of where I've ended up. So, you know, it wasn't to be. No, and it worked out for the best in the end, but still a bit shocking to hear that. I'm really glad to hear that, that things are improving. I'm not surprised to hear that, but, you know, yeah. um, I'm glad things are improving. And um, I do have, um, we have lots of questions and we probably won't be able to get through all of them. But um, just as in terms of becoming a production manager, because um, like you, I, th I think a lot of our students think about becoming a director or a producer and production manager is not the production manager is not necessarily the thing that they think about um yeah. you ended up going that way and what, what would you say to sort of make people think about that a little bit more those more kind of organizational roles and and what skills would you, you know say maybe the three most important skills you would need for that job well i think one of the big skills 
I think having people skills is a really important one in terms of production because we're basically the central hub and we're kind of in a way the front facing for the producers in a way, you know, and I and I think that it ha dealing with people, being approachable, being polite, being like a smiley can do office, although it, it is quite a can be a very pressurized environment at times. I think you've always got to keep your sense of humor and um you know just just to to keep you know the passion alive the, the 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 fun aspect which sometimes gets a bit sucked out of some environments you know so i think just being a good people person is a is a really important part of this because also as you get to being a production manager you're kind of doing deals with people you're you know working out what money they're on um you know and you're you know doing you know they're booking them they will come to you if there's a problem it's kind of really being someone who can go to set talk to the crew check everyone's happy it's kind of it, you you're kind of ticking over with with the grumbles you're dealing with their kind of pay and their payroll which can be something that is obviously people get funny about money you know and being a production manager is someone that has to just kind of deal with some of that kind of tricky stuff that that people can come to you with which can be a little bit difficult to talk about at times um definitely multitasking is a big one um, in production, you're spinning plates. Literally, the focus of what you're doing shifts on a phone call. Phone call will come, bam, that's something massive that's going on that you then have to move away from what you've done and focus on that one thing for a bit, but probably also spinning that plate of what you were doing then as well. And just really being across kind of multiple things really at one time. And the big part really, particularly in production, is teamwork. And, you know, it's it's you're only really as good as your team. So, you know, I have to pick my team carefully. And, and, and a lot of it is about personality. It's really about the people that want to be there, who want to make productions, want to make film, want to make TV, um, you know, are passionate about it and less kind of clock watching and, oh, I'm going into overtime and all that kind of thing. As much as that is part of it, it is a certain drive to do your best each day and, you know, kind of, as I say, try and bring your A game as much as you can, that listening to what's going on about you, working as a team, something's come in, we all have to focus on this, or I'm going to give you this because this has happened and I need to kind of focus on that because all these you know, all these things keep churning, all this work still needs to, you know, keep going. Because in production, we are kind of working a bit on everything. We're looking at what, you know, obviously what's happening, shooting on the day. You're also reporting on what's happened the day before. And you're also looking towards what's kind of coming ahead of you. Whereas a lot of productions generally work kind of in the moment very much of what's happening on set. We're very much kind of looking at the whole picture of, of what's, you know, because obviously we have a post-production team that, and an editorial that are dealing with what's, you know, just been shot. And then we have to look at what's coming up in terms of locations and teams going ahead to set props and make sure that we've got a unit medic there to cover us and risk assessments that are done for health and safety and all these kinds of things, because you can be working across multiple sites, um, you know, you can be prepping something on a stage that's going to be shot. You can have a unit that's off on location. Um, you know, you might be preparing for a shoot that's going kind of overseas and working out how everyone's going to get there and all the logistics. So it can be a very full kind of role and environment. So definitely having a sense of humor, working as a team, you know, being able to multitask. And, you know, in terms of kind of being kind of um, a producer or a director, Absolutely. We need those 100 percent. The reality of how many people get to do that is obviously fairly slim. So although it's good to have a goal, it's good to have a backup plan because you do need to, you know, if you want to be in this industry, you need to be able to work professionally in this industry to make money to live your life. Um, most people who are kind of producers and directors tend to be people that have been doing maybe their own thing on the weekend making their own kind of short films and stuff like this in addition to probably having you know a busy work life they'll they'll do a job and then they'll stop and they'll make their short film and then they'll kind of go back and carry on working and trying to keep a foot in each one and obviously some people do work up the route from being an assistant director so that is becoming a floor runner 
then becoming what's called a third assistant director that deals with kind of directing background extras. Uh, you then become like a second AD who deals with kind of more the paperwork and logistics of the cast and, you know, where the cast are working out the kind of call sheet we do every day to being the first assistant director who kind of runs we call it running the floor, runs the floor. Um, and and generally is the person that actually says action on a set rather than a director. Um, so um, some, some, you know, uh, assistant directors I know have become directors. Um, some people become like a director's assistant. They're doing their own things on the weekend. And then they're trying to, you know, assist a director on a show so that, you know, they can learn the craft and all that kind of thing, which is kind of another way in. And the same kind of with producing again, you know, you can become a producer's assistant, but really you should learn how how filmmaking works before you really decide where you want to go because you might find that you know you want to go somewhere else so running is but definitely the best way to find out where your kind of passions lie because that you might just find something that you you know that you never expected really um you also said about being persistent um you know when you're looking for that first job how important do you think it is for students to get relevant work experience just leading on from what you're saying there whilst well, they're at university yeah definitely I would say that that is you know if, if you want to you know try and get in as soon as you're out of university then I would say definitely try and do some work experience if you can I know as I say I did some in my uh, you know my second year um and I have to say that I've also been someone obviously I'm a very big advocate for training but before there were really a lot of these training schemes I used to bring people on to do work experience just for a week or two for you know expenses and there were probably two or three of those people that I then brought into my team who then I then hired and were in my team for many years you know and then you know you all kind of split up at some point you you know have people that sometimes work with you depending on you know what job you're going into you know that can work with me for several years and then drop off and do something but it's definitely a taster there's like low responsibility which is kind of a good thing it's just kind of seeing you know if you like it do you like that area and certainly you know I had a um I had a trainee on uh, through trainee skills on uh, a Disney film I did a few years ago and he literally spent the time we allowed him to to go around and literally almost like interview people that he wanted to meet he sat with the director he sat with you know the script supervisor and found out what she did he went to the props department he kind of went everywhere to find out you know where he kind of wanted to go and he had been working like M&S or something and is now like you know doing much better than me on every Marvel film going you know so um it 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 definitely um it definitely is persistence and I think it's just opening yourself up to kind of you know any opportunity you can in terms of getting work experience you know don't be you know don't let them take the mickey out of you and work endlessly for free that's that's not what I'm saying but um you know hopefully you'd be able to find somewhere especially now COVID is a little bit more it was you know I think training and work experience in COVID was just a non-starter unfortunately but I think now people are a lot more you know open to you know bringing people on you know shadowing all these kinds of things so great I've got one more question actually what would you advise people well sorry would you advise people to get a driving license if they're hoping to get into the yeah. TV and film industry 100 percent 100 percent I mean obviously some people unfortunately for certain reasons might not be able to drive um health reasons or something like that which i unfortunately can be a little bit uh you know limiting um but i think that more and more so productions are looking to you know extend the you know so that they can have pickup points where people who cannot drive necessarily can get into work but really I found it essential because often, you know, you could have a call time at 5 a.m. in Oxford or something like that, you know, and you've got to travel somewhere quite long distances. You have to be able to get to set every single day and your set could be in central London, which is fine for the tube, but you could be out in Reading before the trains start, you know, and it can be something that, you know, you might find someone that you can have a lift with possibly um I mean certainly when you start as a runner in production a lot of them do need you to be able to drive and have a car or be able to hire a car they will often hire a car for you and um, but if you are driving your own car as a production runner you are given kind of a car allowance which can be 
between 100 and 150 pounds a week and they will pay for your petrol for the runs that you do um so really one of the entry kind of level jobs within production you really do need to have a driving license but more than anything you need to be able to get to and from set which could be anywhere and you might not know where that is i mean i'm saying i'm not saying you can't do it if you don't but it makes your life an awful lot easier otherwise you are a lot more reliant on other people i mean alternatively for that if you can't drive um if you can't financially work that out obviously there are jobs more like you know if you are kind of london based or manchester based or somewhere that has you know a lot of kind of post-production work something like that or working at a production company um obviously most of those are based in kind of cities and you know a more kind of permanent type jobs um where you can go to and from but if you want to actively kind of work on set then i 100 percent try and get your driving license if you can and obviously put that on your cv and if you're a car owner mention that you're a car owner on your cv as well thank you that's, that's, that's really good advice. And um, so we've probably got time for one more question, a quick answer. But what's your favourite memory of York St. John University? Um, I think I have, you know, I think I have a few. Um, but I, I was actually kind of a, a member of the rugby team, actually, believe it or not, for it was only a term because we used to um, kind of do rehearsals and stuff, I think, on like the Wednesday afternoons when generally people did sports. But I was a hooker for a term which was quite funny to tell my parents um and I kind of enjoyed all that kind of social aspect the uh the the rugby socials were always quite good fun but I mean there you know there were many good times I you know obviously lived in halls for the first year enjoyed the summer balls you know all that kind of stuff but um um but yeah I think I think you know social life at university is always you know great fun it's hard to pick one out <laughs> of another one Thank you so much, Emma. That was fascinating. Um, you, you had an amazing career and you're going to continue to do so. And we really appreciate you spending your time and telling us um, and giving all that really good advice, which will be great for our for our students and, 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 and postgrads as well. So thank you so much. Thank you.